Good evening, everyone, and thank you to the Divinity School students who voted. I wasn't necessarily sure how big of a deal it was, and then I got all these emails, and I was like, oh, yeah, it's a big deal. Okay, so thanks. Thanks again. <laughs> well, just to tell you a little bit about what I do, I um, study the spiritual lives of young people, and for years, I came to this task with the assumption that I would listen and observe and study them with the goal of helping them figure out how to live better lives, how to navigate trauma, how to actually have better faith. Well, somewhere along that journey, it kind of struck me that instead of me learning and study or studying how to help them, they were actually helping me. They were teaching me. They actually kept pushing me to, to experience and listen in, in new ways about the world's problems. And the truth of the matter is, I keep coming up short whenever I listen to young people. I keep trying to resonate or, or reflect on what's happening that actually speaks to what's going on in the world around us. But in particular, lately I've been brought up short when it comes to their reflections on violence and the way that violence does or does not intersect with their understandings of God, how, higher powers, general goodness of humanity, or the afterlife. I study um, African-American Christian youth most often. And situated in this particular context, I want to share you, with you a few reflections on youth violence, and a theology of abundant life. But I'm only going to tell you one story, and we're going to do this through the lens of a young woman who we'll call Kira. About five years ago, I first met and interviewed Kira, and she was a rising high school senior at the time, and now she's a senior in college. Kira was and remains an amazing human being, someone I'm actually blessed to call a friend. She grew up in a fairly impoverished and crime-infested neighborhood in Florida. Her schools were labeled failing, and many of her teachers were afraid to push too hard or try too much because it might attract more negative attention to an already bad situation. But Kira, interestingly enough, wasn't concerned about her teachers. But she was concerned with their inability or ineffectiveness in responding to the violence. She was aware of the violence and the deaths around her, and she recounted in this conversation we were having one set of incidents particularly that were particularly vivid for her. She says, we were coming home from church and saw a whole bunch of police and everything, and I just overlooked it. And when I got to school, it was like my friend Michelle, she got shot in the head. But I think people get so used to hearing about death that they become numb. So it wasn't like any coming together or to cry and moan. The teachers didn't help us do any of that. It was just like we're going to put up a big old piece of paper and write a shout out to Michelle, miss you. But then after that, another girl got shot walking home, but she didn't die. So people got used to hearing about death, and especially young death, being at the wrong place at the wrong time that there wasn't any remorse. There wasn't any coming together. And if I don't watch out, I'll get numb too. So as I listened, I was brought up short. Because I didn't understand how she was able to exude so much joy in the midst of this kind of environment. And so I asked her, kind of for my own sake, not just for research, how do you resist? Amazingly and somewhat unexpectedly, she said she witnessed. I said, witness? I'm a little, you know, religious, and I'm like, what does that mean? She says, I attempt to build community. I attempt to show my friends that they are loved. You see, violence wasn't the most significant part of her story. For Kira, her life was divinely orchestrated, she said, around this concept of hope. She said, I 
have such hope in God and in humanity that everything around me that's supposed to be gloomy and doomy pales in comparison. Now, of course, my suspicious, analytical, progressive, academic mind wondered if she was just buying into some pie in the sky theology. And the truth of the matter was, I wondered with a lot of other scholars and researchers if her hope was actually going to impede her ability to actually work for change in the community around her. But Kira kept challenging my assumptions and reminding me of the power of hope and the power of faith and the power of community building in the face of violence, corruption, and innumerable injustices. And so it's interesting that Kira kept pushing me to actually wrestle with this age-old Christian concept of abundant life. And the way she described abundant life, she says, no, 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 it's not just about prosperity or wealth or actually having a, a good life, but it's the ability to take the limits off. I said, what do you mean the limits? She says, everywhere I go, Everywhere people see me, they expect me not to thrive. They expect me not to be successful. And so I want to be able to take the limits off of their perceptions, to take the limits off of the systems that seem to constrain me. So fast forward five years or so from her town in Florida to Ferguson or from South Carolina to New Haven, and while I can't or won't rehearse the, re, um, the stats of youth violence in that time period, neither can I presume that if I had met Kira and interviewed her today, she would give me the same response. But Kira, what, what, what has stood out for me or the thing that I want you to kind of take away in my listening and learning to listen with religious young people is that she gave me some advice. What she said is that in taking off the limits, it's really this opportunity for her to understand how she can actually let or make change happen. So Kira's wisdom was about life, living it to the fullness, and her wisdom for me still rings true. Here's what she reminds me of. Kira's wisdom is that paralyzing despair is not the only option. She reminds me that there is something to be said about participating with kids like Kira in a type of limitless hope that pushes away from nihilism toward sustained persistence in the struggle towards abundant life. So the richness, if you will, of her response is the reminder and the call to listen carefully so that we don't overlook voices or options and that we actually help young people live into some of the limitless ways that will counter the death-dealing, life-stealing systems around them. Thank you.